If you watched the 2014 Winter Olympic Games, chances are you remember seeing the clip of Noel Pikes Pace clearing a barricade and jumping into the stands and into the arms of her family to celebrate her silver medal run in the skeleton. It was called the best moment of the games. Shortly after her silver medal winning performance, Noel said, this is everything I could have imagined and more. Just to have my family here with me and all of the love and support and cheers we've had and all of the trials we've had to overcome to come to this moment. This is as good as gold. Today, we talk with Noelle about the trials she faced on her road to the silver medal and the role of her goals and her faith along the way. Noelle Pikes Pace is a two-time Olympian and 2014 Olympic silver medalist. She is also a two-time world champion as well as an author and motivational speaker. She and her husband, Jansen, have been married for 18 years and are the parents of four children. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Jones, and I am honored to have Noelle Pikes Pace on the line with me today. Noelle, welcome. Thank you. It's so good to be here, Morgan. Well, I have been a fan. I I own your book. You should know that. Um, I, I've been a fan since the Olympics. I think that you were just such a bright light and such a good example and also of just an incredible, inspiring story. So I'm so excited for people to hear more. And I have questions like I've read the book and I've watched videos, but I still have some questions for you. So hopefully we'll answer some some questions that maybe you haven't tackled before. Awesome. Let's dive in. Let's do this. <laughs> So first question is for people that do not know what skeleton is like, how would you describe it? (laughs) All right. So for those of you that don't know what skeleton's like, it's basically like laying on a little cookie sheet and going down the freeway (laughs) at 80 to 90 miles an hour in and out of the corners with your chin less than an inch off off of that pavement. And it's like having concrete barriers to one foot of each side of you. And you're trying to dodge those and steer yourself in and out of those corners. Uh, You can hear the wind flying past your face, flying past your helmet, and it just whistles. It's a really high pitch whistling noise that you hear the whole way down a mile long track and you see distractions all around you. I mean, you see people waving flags and blowing horns and yelling and screaming. And, and the second you turn your head to look at these people, you're gone. Like you're, you're going to hit one of those concrete barriers. So you've got to be 100% and completely focused the entire way down that, that mile long course. So it's pretty exhilarating. Honestly, it's, it's just a huge rush. And the first thousand times that you go down, you have no idea what you're doing or where you're going, but you know, that thousand and first (laughs) time that you go down, there's this thing that clicks and you're like, (gasps) Oh, that's how you do it. Oh, I'm starting to get it, you know, but you have to hit, you have to take those bumps and bruises along the way in order to get down to that finish line. I feel like there are already so many things that you just said that I want to ask you about. But first, I have to say, I am like one of the most cautious people on the face of the planet. So the idea of doing what you just described is like the most horrific thing imaginable. So for for, for people like me that are thinking, why on earth would anybody want to do that? Why did Skeleton appeal to you? And how did you initially get into it? Because I watched this video and you said, like you came home one day and you said you were going to do this, but you didn't say why. So I'm, <laughs> I'm dying to know. Oh man, who wouldn't want to do that, right? Throw yourself down <laughs> 90 miles an hour. This is so fun. For me, I got into it when I was about 16 years old, actually. So I was, I was a youth and I was running track and field at Mountain View High School in Orem, Utah. And my track and field coach actually came up and just said they were recruiting track and field athletes to go up and and try this crazy sport. And it was actually bobsledding was how I got into this. So I went up and I tried bobsledding, which is like a little car, a little tube type thing. So you're, you're, you're more protected. Obviously you have walls around you. Um, so maybe that's how they suckered me into it was to say, Hey, look, you're going to be protected in this little kind of car thing, you know? (laughs) Oh, never mind. We're going to take the walls away and just put your face on the ice. But honestly, I just, I, absolutely love the thrill 
and the speed and the uniqueness of it. I love the technique. I love figuring it out and seeing that there's so much more to learn. Even being a world champion, even being on the Olympic podium, there's still so much more for me to learn. And I'm retired, obviously. I'm retired. I'm done. I'm not going back. But even when I was at the top of my game, there was always more to be learning. There was always more to figure out and another puzzle piece to add to that puzzle. So for me, that that was just exciting to look forward to how I could grow a little bit more each and every day. So I imagine this is not something that you're still like going and doing for fun now. No. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I'm done. No, my, I've got my twin five-year-old boys and that's that's about enough action pack I can handle in one day. <laughs> Bless you. I, I want to come back to something that you said earlier though, Noel, when you were talking about how there are all the distractions and you have to be so focused. How do you maintain focus when you're the one on the little cookie sheet? Yeah, you have to be intentional about it. It's, I mean, you have to make a decision before those distractions come, what you will do once those distractions arrive in, in your face and in your life. If you don't know before that, what you will do or how you will try to handle those distractions, then it's going to kick you off your course. I mean, it it will. And just, I mean, in life, you know, in life, we have distractions all around us. And especially now, they're just more prevalent than ever with, you know, social media, the news, just so much going on in our lives that can distract us and take us off course from not just from like, you know, year to year, but I'm talking day to day, what are we here to do? What's our purpose? And just like in skeleton, if somebody's waving a flag in my face and screaming and yelling and I'm flying 90 miles an hour and I take my eyes off of the direction that I want to go, even just for a split second, I'm going to be, I'm going to come off of my course and hit a wall, hit a wall or two. And I'm going to say, man, that wasn't what I wanted. That wasn't the kind of race I wanted to run. And as we go through our day, if we, you know, as our thumb automatically goes to social media devices in the morning and we get distracted from our day and we say, man, what happened to that hour, that two hours or five hours of my life? What just happened? And all of a sudden we come out kind of feeling just upset and frustrated and tense. It's the same similar principle, just being intentional with, your time and with your purpose and with your direction and saying, I already know what I'm going to do when I see those distractions coming. And I'm going to keep my sights looking forward where I want to go rather than where I don't want to end up. Yeah, that's profound. Noel, I think that your story is so incredible because you were the number one skeleton athlete in the world when you were hit by a bobsled, which how does that even happen? I heard that story and I was like, what? <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. And and when I got hit by the bobsled, it was really one of those Titanic moments, you know, where if one thing had gone right, then it would have never happened. But it was literally like one problem to another problem to another problem to another mistake. And it just ended up in myself getting hit by bobsled and four of my teammates were in the track as well. And it was just a messy situation. The brakeman never pulled the brakes and they came flying out of the track onto the pavement where we were waiting for a truck. So yeah, it it was, it was a one in a million chance. And, you know, a lot of times you're like, oh, I hope I'm that one in a million. But (laughs) in this case, getting hit by bobsled isn't necessarily on the top of anyone's priority list. But to be honest, you know, people have asked me, would I go back and change that? Would I go back if I could and do it differently if I if I knew that was going to happen? And knowing what I know now, I'm I'm actually grateful, as weird as this sounds, but I'm grateful for the trials in my life. Not that I'd ever wish them upon myself or upon anybody else. I don't I'm not one of those people that asks for trials to come into my life. I have plenty of them. I always think that's a terrible (laughs) idea. That's a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea, Morgan. But I am grateful for the challenges that have come into my life because of who they have helped me to become. And I wouldn't be here in this exact situation or in this place or with my family and the way that we are had I not gone through those trials. and. I think one of the biggest things is while we're going through trials, just like, you know, those distractions on a track, those distractions in our lives, we have to know, we have to have a plan. 
beforehand as to what we will do when those trials come. Not It's not if, in skeleton, it's not if you crash, but when you crash. And we have to know in life, we're going to have crashes. We're going to have times of trials and, and tests as they come. But if we know beforehand how we will move forward through those things, if we know that we will rely on our Savior, Jesus Christ, through those experiences and that he can be our strength and we can rely on the atonement of Jesus Christ for that enabling power to make us stronger and help us through these dark times of hitting these walls in and out, bouncing back and forth down our track, down our course of life, we will make it out safely. I mean, it's not if we will make it out safely, we will make it out safely as we rely on his power. And that's what I've seen in my life through the bobsled accident, through many of the other trials I've faced. I know where my sights are set and and I trust in him forever. Yeah. Another thing that you went through, so after you come back from the bobsled accident, you were a tenth of a second away from a medal in 2010. You finished in fourth place, and you've said it was because your shoestring was dragging. (laughs) Oh, my word. A tenth of a second, you guys. Do you know how do you know how close that is? Like a tenth of a second for an Olympic medal. I just I have to I have to tell you the next, you know, four years later when I went to the Olympics again, I had zippers on my shoes. Zippers. I didn't do shoelaces anymore. <laughs> You're like, I'm done with shoelaces. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> So, so my question about this is I recently interviewed Michaela Skinner, who was an alternate on the women's gymnastics team, and she's currently preparing to try to make the 2021 Olympics now. And so for somebody that has tried for this for a long time, just like you, you know, had some setbacks, what advice would you have for someone in that situation? And it could be Michaela, it could be somebody else trying for something significant. But what advice would you have? And why was it so important to you not to give up? My advice to her, for those that don't know, she's, you know, pushing her way through gymnastics. And the Olympics have been obviously postponed this year due to the pandemic. And for those of you that don't understand what it takes to get to that point to be able to, you know, go to nationals, to be able to qualify for the Olympic games. It is a life. I mean, it's your life. You dedicate, you put off everything else to make this dream possible. So I guess my advice to her and to, to others would be, you never know what's just around the corner. You know, a lot of times when we're in our darkest moments, that's when we're being tested the absolute most. And that darkness seems to last for quite some time. But we just continue to have faith and continue to take those couple steps into the darkness. And as Elder Bednar says, a lot of times that light, that inspiration doesn't come like a flipping on of the switch. You know, we don't go into it. It's not like when we're looking for answers as to why did this happen to me? How can I continue to move forward? A lot of times it's not like going into a room and flipping a switch, but it's more like the gradual rising of the sun. It's like when the sun is just coming up over the mountains and you can see just a little bit of glimmer. You can see that little bit of hope. So you take another step. And I would say to just keep stepping forward, keep pushing, keep working hard and never give up on those dreams. Because for me, I would rather go into something full-heartedly and and maybe miss miss out because I gave my best but miss out and just fall short rather than turn and look back and have regrets along the way. So I have I have a a quote that I like to share with my kids and it says you win some you learn some you only lose some if you never learn. And I don't believe that we ever lose anything. I don't believe that we ever fail or that we ever fall short of something unless we don't learn from that experience. But those experiences where I've missed out on the 2006 Winter Olympic Games because I got hit by a bobsled or where I finished fourth because my shoelaces were dragging, you know, no excuses really for me. I should have tidied up and figured that out beforehand. But for me, it's only losing if I couldn't learn from it. And I have learned more from my from my shortcomings than I ever have from any success. So continue pushing forward. Look for that light. Even if it's just a glimmer, look for the things to be grateful for. Always looking for things to be grateful for can add so much light and perspective in our lives. 
Yeah. You mentioned no regrets. And I think that's what your husband said to you, right? When he was encouraging you to go for the 2014 Olympics. One thing that I noticed as I watched videos with you is how many times you said Jansen and I, or you'd say my husband and I. And the thing that I thought was like so touching as I watched these videos where you talked about that experience and about kind of setting that goal as a family to for you to to achieve that is that I think a lot of people would probably look at this and be like, this lady is going to slide down a ice track at 90 miles per hour head first and she has kids like yeah. that's crazy. But I think it was so cool to see that your husband was so supportive of that goal. And in fact, it was him that was like the motivating factor. So what did it mean to you to have that kind of support in your marriage? Man, it was I mean, it it meant and it still continues to mean everything to me and to us. So just a quick brief background. So yes, we had Lacey, our oldest daughter before the 2010 Olympic Games. And at that point, I was traveling the world all by myself. I mean, with my skeleton team, but without my family. So I left and my daughter, when I went to the 2010 Olympic Games, she had just turned two. And I missed, I mean, I can't, I, it was so hard. I was so torn. I mean, I wanted to be sliding and working out when I was at home. And when I was at home, I kept thinking about sliding. Well, my mind and my heart were never in the same place at the same time. And so it was extremely difficult. I missed Lacey's first steps. I missed her first birthday. I missed her first words. I missed everything. And I was just so heartbroken going into 2014, going into the Olympics in Vancouver, Canada. That to be honest, like when I crossed that finish line in fourth place, I had a huge smile on my face. And it wasn't because it was almost because I didn't even comprehend the finish that I had just received that fourth place, which is the worst place to finish. But I was done. Like I... I was done. I wanted to be at home with Jansen. I wanted to be home with Lacey. And I was just done with that atmosphere. It wasn't conducive to my beliefs and to being married. It just it just wasn't the best atmosphere. And so after I retired after 2014, we had Trace in our second child. And then what really drove me to come back was I was actually pregnant with our third child. And it was a little girl. And at 18 weeks, her little heartbeat just stopped beating. And for me, after the 2014 games, I knew I just wanted to be a mom. Like number one in the world, I just wanted to be a mom. The athletics is awesome. There's so many great things in this life, but I wanted to be a mom and be home with them. And when that little baby's heart just stopped beating, I was devastated. I was a mess. Like I... <laughs> I couldn't think of anything. Anytime I saw anybody that was pregnant, I would just start crying. Anytime I'd see somebody holding a little baby, a little baby in their arms, I would just start crying and I couldn't help myself. And Jansen saw this and he knew that I needed to move forward towards something. And I wasn't ready to get pregnant again. I wasn't ready to move forward with our family quite yet. But he knew I still loved Skeleton and he knew the joy that it brought to both of our lives. And so it was actually him that said, Hey, how about how about what if we could do this together as a family? If you go back to compete, what if we could do this together as a family? And that was like this whole new light in my life. And to be able to say, wow, I can do this thing that I love. He actually developed, he actually built and designed my sled along with my brother-in-law, Troy. And they built and designed this sled for me to be able to compete on, which was absolutely incredible. And then I remember seeing Lacey going over there when she was three or four years old and she started drawing on it with crayons. And I'm like, oh no, 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 that's my Olympic sled. Like, ah, she's drawing on it, Jansen. And then all of a sudden I looked, I'm like, Oh, it's so cute. I remember just like, okay, I'm totally leaving. On there. <laughs> so <laughs> it just became a family affair. And it means everything to have him by my side. He's my best friend. And it wasn't an I did this. I won this medal. I am so awesome. Look at me, people. It definitely is a we. We did this. And even when I say we, you know, Jansen and I truly believe it wasn't even just us. I mean, yes, it's me and him all along the way. And it's not a give and take. Hopefully it's a give and give. 
but it's we as in the community and the people that supported us all along the way. There were so many more people than just the two of us that made it possible to win that silver medal. So it really, it really is a piece of everybody that, that cheered for us all along the way and were there to support us. Yeah. I think anybody that watched the 2014 Olympics remembers that moment where you ran to your family and climbed over and were hugging them. And I still like get emotional just thinking about it. But I think that that's such a beautiful example of, you know, making adjustments that make it conducive to the spirit and inviting God into that experience and, and your family. And I think also such a good reminder. I have a friend that always says champions pay the price. And certainly you paid a price in doing this, but then making adjustments so that that price is one that's worth paying. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you mentioned it because at the base of this, at the very foundation of this whole Olympic journey, we committed Jansen and I long ago to always put God first, always, always, always. And that come what may first, middle, last crash, whatever happens on the ice, whatever happens in our lives, no matter what, we will not deviate from our sights being set on our Savior, Jesus Christ and on our Heavenly Father. And that that is first and foremost, the, the, the number one principle in our marriage I know that that's what's held us so tight together. You know, it doesn't mean that it's always going to be easy. That's not that's not what it means at all. But it does mean that when those rocks come and when those trials and tribulations and the world wants to tell us one thing and we're trying so hard to figure out the path that we should be on, it does mean that we will strive to hear him. It does mean that we will strive to listen to a prophet's voice and to say, How can we invite the spirit into our home amidst all the chaos, all the confusion, all the distractions around us? How can we be going down this track of life together and be fully committed to crossing that finish line um, in, in the best way possible. And for us, we've realized along our way through the bumps and, and bruises that we've, that we've had, that it's always by keeping our sights set on our savior, Jesus Christ. He is that finish line. He is the one that can carry us through when we do hit, not if we crash, but when we crash, our savior, Jesus Christ is that savior and that, that redeemer that can save us through those, those trials. Yeah. Kind of building off of that, Noel. I watched a TEDx talk that you gave, and we'll put that in our show notes because it's excellent. But you said, where you look is where you'll go. And when I emailed you about coming on the show, you told me that one thing that you've had on your heart recently is the idea of I'll go where you want me to go, which is obviously something that's familiar to members of the church. But I think there's significance when you compare that past statement, where you look is where you'll go with I'll go where you want me to go. So what have you learned about those two phrases. Wow. There have been times in my life where, so, so let me explain a tiny bit really quick. In skeleton, our vision is so critical as we're going down a track, going 90 miles an hour and steering, we apply pressures with our shoulders and our knees, and we're constantly torquing our sled the entire way down a mile long course, countering against the pressures that come. And if our sights, the second that our vision gets distracted, the second we look, you know, two inches to the right, our sled will go two inches to the right. And we, we go where we look, where our vision is taking us. That's where our sled will go. And in life, you know, where we look is where we go. Where are we setting our sights each and every day? What are we doing with our habits? And in the morning, what's the most important thing before you leave your bedroom? Are you saying your prayers or reading scriptures or are you just getting up and rushing through the day? So one of the things that's been on my mind and heart lately is I'll go where you want me to go. That's actually, it's one of my absolute favorite hymns. And I remember having this thought even before the 2014 game. So before I won the Olympic silver medal, just wanting to fully commit myself to doing the Lord's will. And that's, that's easier said than done. I I wanted to make sure that whether I took first, second, third, or even fourth again, or what if I crash and finish dead last, I wanted to commit to go where he wanted me to go. I wanted to be an instrument in his hands and for him to place me 
where I could be utilized the most to be the best for the world. One of my my good friends, he always says, Clint Pulver always says that it's not enough to be the best in the world, but we should be the best for the world. And I wholeheartedly agree in that agree with that statement. Where you look is where you go. And as we go where the Lord wants us to go, our lives will be tremendously better. Our talents will be amplified. Our The people's paths that we cross are going to be the ones that we can connect with the most. And that's as we connect our will with the Lord's will. Where we look is where we go. So if we're setting our sights on our own will and our own desires, it's only going to take us so far and it's going to be a rough, rocky road. But as we connect our will with His will and connect our sight with His sight, He'll take us all the way. Yeah. I love that so much. And I think a big part of that is goals. And I couldn't help but notice based both on a video that you and your family did where you talked about goals, fun family goals, I think it was. And then also your Hope Works talk, you talked about setting goals. And I was so impressed by your approach to goals. And so my first question for you about this is when you go about setting goals, how do you set them? And then secondly, why do you think goals are so important? Oh man, Morgan, I love setting goals. We <laughs> just we just love it. Like <laughs> they're like the possibilities are endless. Like you can do anything <laughs> in this life. It's so cool. So so right before the Olympics happened, and I would recommend this to everybody listening, uh, just take some time to write down everything and anything that you've ever wanted to do. Like give yourself just freedom to go crazy. Give yourself freedom to just go out there and write down whatever it is, even when you were five years old and you wanted to try something and you're like, nah, like I can't do that. Anytime you've ever said, nah, I can't, or man, that's too far out there. Just write it down. So Before the 2014 games, this was literally like a week before the games or two weeks, maybe my husband and I could feel this strain of knowing that retirement was just around the corner, knowing that this huge chapter in our life was about to come to an end. And so we said, well, what can we do? Like, how can we make it so that this doesn't hit us in depression and anxiety and just worry? Like, how do we make it so that we can move past these feelings that naturally want to come? And we said, you know what? Let's just make a bucket list. And so we just started writing down everything and and anything. I'm not kidding. Like, like the craziest things that you can imagine. And our, our bucket list isn't like, you know, like swimming with sharks in the middle of the Pacific at 300 feet down. But that's not like, we just don't, we don't really care about that stuff. But like you talk about juggling or learning some songs on guitar or, or we want to, this may have been mine, but like singing a song on YouTube that gets 10,000 views. We still have to do that. I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to talk Jansen into that one. And he's like, I'm doing what? (laughs) I feel like maybe what you should do is you put that song on YouTube and then we'll drive traffic to it. We'll get you those 10,000 views. Yes, that's awesome. I love it. I love it. Do you hear that, Jansen? (laughs) You're in business. He's going to be thrilled. (laughs) I love it, Morgan. So anyway, I would just say like, just really just go crazy, write it down, anything and everything from, from playing a musical instrument to getting up and speaking in front of somebody that maybe has been a little, you know, maybe speaking is scary for you. Do the things that scare you, the things that are holding you back and the things that you say, oh, I don't think I could, whatever it is, just write it down. And even just yesterday, I wrote like two or three more on our bucket list. Every day I go by and I'm like, oh, that would be really cool. And I'll just like get on my phone. I have a, we have this shared note that we share on our phones and I'll just get on and I'll be like, Hey, guess what? I just added to our bucket list today. You know, we're going to hike Kilimanjaro or something like that. (laughs) I don't know, just something crazy, but I would just say to just start with discovery and, and the, the churches, the church has the children and youth program for setting goals. And they actually, I don't think it's just for kids. If if you want to know how to set goals, they do an excellent job of putting it in order and explaining how the, a great way to set goals is. And the first step is just discovering, like just discover what it is that you love. And then you plan it out and then you act on it and then you reflect. And so that's a great cycle to get into for setting goals and to just know that nothing is impossible. And, and that by small and simple things, great things are brought to pass. So for us, you can't just start juggling in one day. 
but you can start by throwing one ball up, right? And then by the end of three days, you could probably do two balls and one in each hand. And then by the end of seven days, you might be able to crisscross those balls, just two balls at a time. And by the end of 10 days, all of a sudden you're doing three balls, just one at a time. And it's just baby steps. Don't look at the big picture when you're setting a goal. Try and break it down into the absolute smallest pieces that you can handle. And you can do anything that, I mean, you could play fly to the bumblebees on the piano. If you just do it one note at a time, anything is possible. Yeah. I loved it when you were talking about this on the, on the hope works talk, you said, I just want to see what my best can be. And I thought that was like such a good approach. Cause I think so, so many times we're like, Oh, well, like you said, I can't do that. Or I wouldn't be very good at that. But I think if you approach it as I just want to see what my best can be, then you're willing to try it. I noticed when I was watching that talk, I scrolled down and there were a bunch of comments, all of them positive, but one person said, man, she's competitive. (laughs) And I thought that was so funny. I think because I'm a really competitive person. So I empathize with that. But you, I want to talk a little bit about competing versus comparing because you've talked some about that. You're obviously very competitive, but how do you keep that competitive drive from comparing yourself to others? Yeah, that's huge. There's a massive difference between competing and comparing. And the world wants us to compare. The world wants us to feel like if I'm not as good as them, then why try? The world wants us to say, oh, second place is the first loser. And that's not, that's not what God intended. That's not how it's supposed to be. That's not it at all. Even in competing at the Olympic, at the most highest elite level, I had to understand, and it and this didn't come to me as a rookie. I've got to tell you, this took some practice and some intentionality. But at that highest level of competition, I realized that it was never a competition between me and them. It was always a competition between me and me. And I had to just pick it apart and say, what is my absolute best today? What can I give? How can I improve? What did I mess up on so I can improve so I can be better tomorrow? And instead of looking around us, it's, it's so easy to get caught up in the comparison game. Oh my word, especially with so much social media and distractions around us to say, Oh, they just went on this awesome trip. Why can't I do that? Oh, look how tan they are. Oh, what about me? Oh, she can do that really well. Or he can go there. It's so easy to get caught up in that. And, um, instead of thinking of it as comparing ourselves with each other, competing to me means you're giving your absolute best. Like, yes, I am a competitor and I will give my absolute best. And if I take second place and I gave my absolute best and as the world compares and you have to get that ranking and I show up as a number two next to my name, guess what? If I gave my absolute absolute best, I'm going to jump in the stands and celebrate with my family. (laughs) I didn't, I didn't lose the gold medal. I won the silver. And there's a huge difference in that mindset to say, you know, that comparison is, yes, I lost the gold, but that competitiveness says, no, I won the silver. And to give yourself that privilege of saying, I gave my absolute best. There was absolutely nothing more I can do. I'm going to, I'm going to celebrate this success all along the way. If somebody else can juggle better than I can, who cares? Good job. I'm so proud of you. And to support them, but at the same time to give my absolute best in whatever it is that I'm doing. And I, maybe I can only juggle a couple times, but guess what? I'm, it's better than I could do yesterday. So yes, to be a competitor just means that you have the mindset to say, I'm going to try. You have that courage to say, I'm going to give it my best despite the outcome. And I'm going to see where this leads me. Thank you. That was amazing. Another thing that I love that you said, you said that God doesn't expect us to be the best in the world at something. He expects us to have faith and he expects us to try. So Noel, my question for you is what has your faith meant to you in your life? Ah, uh, faith is everything. I <laughs> I don't know where I'd be without faith. It would be a very I I know I'd be just so sad and so lost without faith that I've had. Um he expects us to just give our best and to try, but he expects us to have faith in him and to say, Heavenly Father, so even with something as simple, I'm just coming back to the juggling just because that's kind of a, you know, a, just like a kind of a silly goal maybe <laughs> to try to achieve. But even with something like that, if it matters to you, then it matters to him. 
And even for something as small as juggling or as any goal in your life or as anything that you're wanting to achieve or find an answer for, if it matters to you, then it matters to him. And it takes faith, the grain of a mustard seed. If you could imagine a mustard seed and how small and seemingly insignificant that seed is, to know that if you had that much faith, you could literally move mountains. How can we not have faith? How can we not put our faith and our hope and our trust in Him? I used to have this saying growing up, I used to think, you know, hope for the best and expect the worst. And I felt like that was a pretty good way to go through life. I felt like it kept me protected from getting really hurt in life when those trials came. It helped me to kind of build a wall around my heart and myself to be able to say, you know what, if bad things happen, it's all right, because I expected it. Like, I can get through this on my own. And then a, a big trial came in my life where I realized that by expecting the worst to happen, I was still miserable. Like, the whole process through this trial And thereafter, I was so miserable and it was so hard to pick myself back up and to get back on my feet again. And I I had this kind of this aha moment, I guess, when I realized that by hoping for the best and expecting the worst, all I was doing was limiting my faith and hope in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And instead of hoping for the best and expecting the worst, I needed to hope for the best and expect the best and rely on that faith and that hope in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And once that happened, the walls of fear and anxiety and doubt and um, despair started to crumble around me because I could see the light that our Savior, Jesus Christ was offering. But that was only through faith in him and a hope for a better day. Thank you so much. That reminds me, my trainer on my mission, she wrote me a letter. I think it actually may have been like her homecoming talk. When she got home, she emailed it to me. And she was talking about the different principles of the gospel. And at the very end, she got to endure to the end. And she said that the biggest thing that she had learned was that Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just to give us a light at the end of the tunnel, but light all the way through. And so I love that idea of expecting the best. And I think that's what the Lord wants to give us. And he wants us to have that light in our life all the way through. Noel, I was reading something on NBC Sports on their caption of a video with you. They said, skeleton athlete Noel Pikes Pace dives headlong into seemingly everything she does. From competing in one of winter's fastest sports to raising her family, Noel is all in. And I was like, it's a sign. She <laughs> we're supposed to do this episode. Um, but at the end of every episode of this podcast, we always ask the same question. And that is, what does it mean to you to be all all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I love this question. Uh, To me, to be all in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ means setting your sights on our Savior, Jesus Christ, at all times and in all things and in all places, wherever you are, whatever comes your way, that you will put your focus on Him and planning ahead to know that this life isn't meant to be easy. We are faced right now with so many, you know, so many distractions around us, so much temptation, so much worry, fear, doubt, concern, anxiety. You just turn on the news and you can see it all around us. And to know that we always have a choice. Being all in means using our agency, not just having our agency, but actually using it to do good and to follow our Savior's example each and every day, to be resilient to know that when hard times come, we will make the choice to turn our sights to him. I'll go where you want me to go. That's what it means to be all in. Thank you so much, Noel. You are a delight. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with me. And we will be rooting for you off the ice. (laughs) Thanks, Morgan. You're awesome. 
We are so grateful to Noelle Pikes Pace for joining us on today's episode. You can find Noelle's book, Focused, Keeping Your Life on Track, One Choice at a Time, on DeseretBook.com. As always, thanks to Derek Campbell from Mix at Six Studios, and thank you so much for choosing to spend your time with us. We'll be with you again next week.